When we choose the focus of a GeoTalk meeting, we try to pick a subject which has a link with our current activities on field. In this region, as you know it, we are working in Chad and Cameroon. Some of our colleagues from Madrid also work in the south of Niger, in the region of Difa. And uh, basically, all of the orange zones that you can see here are the zones where Action Contre la Fin works. For a few months now, in particular since uh, December, we have tried to apply a regional approach concerning the dynamics of the population displacements in this area. When it comes to Boko Haram and the population disp displacements linked to this phenomenon, the consequences affect in particular two big states in the northeast of Nigeria, the state of Yobe and the state of Borno. Um, in this region, there are around 1.5 million displaced people, and there are also refugees in the whole region. In Niger, the refugees are mostly concentrated in the area of Difa and around the Lake Chad, and on the Chadian, Chadian side, there are about 12,000 to 14,000 people. Um, almost 70,000 refugees live in the far north region of Cameroon, 45,000 to 50,000 are already in a camp, and others are still waiting for placement. And in the hinterland of Cameroon, there are about 100,000 displaced people. You probably remember that we have already talked about this situation, and we have already wondered how we were going to intervene there. there. We started to act in Cameroon about one year ago, and the goal was to take care of the Central African refugees. It's true that we faced some difficulties in, in stabilizing the situation out there, and not for good reasons. The reasons were mostly that we had problems in coordinating the humanitarian response in the country. And it also took us a while to set up some activities in the north, because we had difficulties in assessing precisely the needs and in giving an adequate re response. So now it's done. We have stabilized the operations in the east, in the Cameroon region, where there are 200,000 refugees, more or less. We have sent a team, which has left yesterday, and will arrive tonight in Marwa, in the north Cameroon. They will arrive with the members of another NGO, and out there they will undertake a multi-sectoral assessment. We're not going to focus especially on the refugees camps there because uh, this problem is already being taken care of by the UN and by some NGOs, but um, the displaced populations in this region is still a problem which needs uh, responses to be adopted. I will finish by saying that we have also an office uh, that we keep running in the Chadian region right there. It's not very active, it's, it's an office working in a kind of standby mode actually. This region here is an endemic area for cholera, with cholera outbreaks every two years on average. So in addition to the troubles linked to Boko Haram, it's also a very complicated environment. Malnutrition ra rates are particularly high, both in terms of chronic malnutrition and acute malnutrition, and it's also a region with a very important demography. Nigeria is literally a demographic monster, and one-third of the Cameroonian population lives around the Lake Chad. So the Lake Chad is a, a very important demographic pool in the region. I have finished presenting our current activities in the region. I will now give the floor to Marc-Antoine, who is going to add a historical perspective to this discussion. He's going to tell us how Boko Haram was formed, how the conflicts have evolved, what are the big trends of the movement, and he's also going to tackle a question which interests us, which is the impact that the phenomenon is going to cause in the next next few months, in particular in the light of the recent evolutions, the change in presidency in Nigeria, and of course in light of the two attacks which have taken place in Jamena. They have not been officially claimed by Boko Haram yet, but it's quite obvious um, who the responsible of these attacks are. So we will be speaking about that, and I now give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Well, yes, that's true. I wear several hats. Uh, for a long time, I was a researcher at the Research and Development Institute 
uh, which is pretty much the equivalent of the CNRS for the countries of the South. And today I'm a teacher at the French Institute of Geopolitics at the University of Paris 8. Uh, when, when you're on the subway and you reach the station La Fourche, instead of going towards Anier, you go the other way until you reach the terminus and it's there. Anyway, I wear several hats because I'm also an expert of Nigeria. I have worked on this country for almost 30 years. I have teach there, well, at least I tried, but it was a failure. I'm also an expert for Chatham House, which is a think tank close to the Foreign Office of London. And I say this because if you're interested in the subject of Boko Haram, then you can download on the internet a report that I made for them last year. Speaking about reports uh, that you can download, I'd also like to mention two of them, which are much more recent and which have been published by the Foundation Jean Jaurès. You can download them in French and in English, and these reports will provide you with elements of analysis on the regional coalition, which has been formed recently against Boko Haram. I'm also a research associ associate at PRIO, which is the Peace Research Institute in Oslo, which has a great reputation for its work on armed conflicts. The analysis of this institute, however, are centered on a quantitative approach, whereas personally I am more close to the French model of political sciences, which favor qualitative studies. On the field, I've been working on Boko Haram since 2005. There aren't many of us who do so. Uh, we are only four of us. There is a, a British, a French, a Gabonese, and a Nigerian who are present in the region and who try to see beyond what is told in the media. Because there is a real distortion between the image given by the media of Boko Haram as a group which has sworn allegiance to Daesh and which is engaged in a kind of globalized jihad and the reality on the field, which is very different. And that will actually be my main message today. The message that I really want to convey today is that in this Borna region in the states of uh, Borno, Yobe and Adamawa, uh, the media always insist a lot on the Islamic aspect of the insurgency. But in reality, on the field, what we are dealing with is a number of micro-conflicts, with groups gathering together and taking part to the wider conflict for other reasons, in order to settle accounts with each other, to take over land. There are even individuals who covet their neighbor's wife, so it has really come to this. So when you look at the insurgency today, in fact, it's quite far from being a jihad. There is a real distortion between the image broadcasted by the media of a globalized jihad with the Islamic State, which is invading Nigeria and other countries, and the reality of the field, which is in fact much more complex from a social perspective. I don't know how much you know about Nigeria. Uh, it's an English-speaking country, and it's true that very often we French people don't know much about the English-speaking parts of Africa. Uh, that means that there are still many people in the media who mix up Niger and Nigeria. A uh, big French newspaper, and I will actually say its name, Le Monde, used to say that during the 1980s, uh, the Sharia law was gaining importance in Nigeria, and they justified this fact by saying that the president was Muslim, whereas he was in fact Christian. So my point is we're really dealing with a country which is not very well known by many people. It's quite shocking really because it's a huge country which plays an important role in the African context and in the world. And this country projects an image which is quite blurred, ambivalent, almost schizophrenic. On the one side you have the year of Nigeria as an emerging power, and on the other side you have the crisis of Boko Haram. If you compare the town of Maiduguri with Lagos, which is the biggest city of sub-Saharan Africa, Africa, the two cities are separated by more than a thousand kilometers and they have absolutely nothing in common. Maiduguri looks a bit like Mogadishu in terms of the organization of the city. And on the other side, Lagos claims to be the new Dubai of Africa. It's a modern city which was built on the ocean. Maybe you have heard of the Nigerian cinema which is developing there, etc. So there is a real contrast between this Nigeria which is seen as an emerging power uh, it's the most populated country of Africa, and in 2050, it will be the third most populated country of the world. We will have India in the first position, then China, then Nigeria, and then the U.S.
I also work in the demographer laboratory because, as I've told you, I wear several hats. And when I speak with them, there isn't a shred of a doubt on this. There is no discussion about this. In 2015, Nigeria will be the first most populated country in the world. And I'm not so sure that this is being taken into account by the big decision makers of our time. Nigeria is also the first economy in Africa. And this was made possible thanks to the World Bank, which has started to integrate in its analysis some elements of the Nigerian economy, such as the informal trade, for example, which were not taken into account before. As a consequence today, the Nigerian GDP is well above that of South Africa or Egypt. It's the first African producer of oil today and will soon become the first producer of gas. So it is really a very important state. So on the one side, you have this rather positive image of a country which is developing. As you may know, uh, the concept of BRICS, uh, this group of countries gathering Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, has become a bit old-fashioned. And today, we talk much more about the mint, Mexico, Indonesia, Nigeria, Turkey. Nigeria wasn't part of the BRICS, but it is now one of the mint countries. So there is a real enthusiasm around Nigeria, and it strikes me because in the past, the speech was much more pessimistic, especially at the time of the military dictator of 1999. Today, with the recent election of Muhammadu Buhari, the general image given by the country is much more positive. Now, I was talking about schizophrenia earlier because at the same time, there are many critiques which are made towards this country, which is unable to contain this movement, this sect that we call Boko Haram. I'm going to talk a little bit about the movement. So it's quite difficult, it's quite challenging to be talking about Boko Haram because we have in fact very few information coming from the field. I started working on this particular region in 2005 and in the mid-2000 we were working much more on another insurgency which was uh, around Pour Harcourt and which was called the MEND. Um, violence has moved a lot in um, Nigeria so in the beginning of the year 2000, it was an, an there was a, an insurgency in the region of Lagos, which was called uh, OPC. Then in the mid-2000, uh, you had the MEND, and we could already see back at that time the beginning of an insurgency, uh, which wasn't called Boko Haram yet, but uh, that we called the Talibans of Nigeria. I started working around this frontier right here in 2005, and in 2009 things got complicated. So I started working on fields in the state of Borno from 2009 until 2011-2012. And at this point, the airport of Maiduguri was closed. Maiduguri is the capital of Borno. Nigeria is a federation of 36 states, and Borno is one of these states. And it is here that the insurgency of Boko Haram really started. And since 2013, I can't do any field work anymore in Maiduguri because the airport has been closed by the military. So now I work mostly from the region of Difa. I have been there many times since the beginning of the year. The last time I was there was two or three months ago. And I realized at that time that it was very hard to do field work these days in a war zone. So what I mean is that it's very difficult to check the information. You see a lot of things which circulate on the internet, and believe me, they all underline the necessities of a proper research on the field on this matter. It's very challenging, as I was saying, because we're dealing with a group which in fact isn't called Boko Haram, and we're not even sure if their leader, Abu Bakr Shekau, is still alive. So to make it simple, I will call it Boko Haram, a name which conveys the idea that Western education is a sacrilege, not a sin, because a sin is a Christian concept, so often the name Boko Haram is not well translated. But the real name is Jamatu Ali Suna Lidawati Wal Jihad. I agree, it's much more difficult, so I will call it Boko Haram. But you have to know that this name means people committed to the Prophet's teachings for pro propagation and jihad. This group was founded at the beginning of the year 2000 under the aegis of a very charismatic preacher called Muhammad Yusuf. And I insist on the fact that there has been many evolutions inside the group before it became the terrorist group that we know today. So to put it in simple terms, knowing that it is a very complex matter and that we don't have much time, I will try to organize my presentation around two ideas. 
First, I would like to tell you why Daesh is not really a threat in this particular region and why it won't have a great impact from the operational perspective. I'm going to talk about the evolution of the sect and how it became a terrorist movement. And in the second part, I'd like to tell you about what the recent election of Muhammadu Buhari is going to change. He was elected in March and he took office at the end of May. So what is this going to change on the field? My first point consists in saying that Daesh and the fact that Boko Haram has re recently sworn allegiance to Daesh is not going to change much. It's very unlikely that tomorrow a group of tanks will be sent from Iraq to join the state of Borno and Maidogori. Moreover, many elements tend to show that Boko Haram is a kind of a free electron in the global jihadist movement. We know that there has been some individual communication, but not massive communications, between some members of Boko Haram and ACME in 2012. Just before ACME, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb took over some provinces in the north of Mali. Some contacts were indeed made with a dissident group of Boko Haram called Ansaru, from which we haven't heard for a while. Uh, their last video dates back to January. It's a group which is active outside Boko Haram's sphere of influence. And their last video was shot right after an attack led by the army of Baoshi uh, around here on the map. Some abductions were committed in this zone right here. You may have heard the story of this French engineer who was um, adopted, abducted sorry, and who managed to escape on his own. So there has been some contact, some communications with ACME, but not an operational al alliance, that's for sure. And the best proof of that is the fact that there is a faction of Boko Haram which has left the group leaded by Abu Bakr Shikau because it didn't agree with the killing of Muslims. Indeed, we are in a region which is predominantly Muslim, and even if sometimes Christian minorities are also attacked by the movement, the majority of victims, and notably civilian victims, are in fact Muslims. It's important to keep that in mind because very often the jihad is presented as a war between, between religions. Uh, but the jihad, when it takes a violent form, which is not always the case, by the way, the word jihad refers primarily, primarily to a spiritual and internal effort. But anyway, uh, many jihads on which different historians have worked are jihads which, in fact, happened inside Islam. And uh, Boko Haram is also, above all, a war inside Islam. And indeed, this dissident group, which is very close from an, uh, an ideologic perspective to Al-Qaeda, has left Boko Haram, holding against its members to be killing mostly Muslims. That was in 2012. So there are a few individual contacts, but it doesn't go much further than this. Moreover, the ideology of Boko Haram is quite heterodox compared to the orthodoxy of Al-Qaeda, which is really a Wahhabit movement of Saudi inspiration. The proof of that is the fact that Mohammed Yusuf, the founder of Boko Haram, was chased away from the movement Izala. The Izala movement is a movement which is very present in the north of Nigeria, and conversely to Boko Haram, it doesn't challenge the Nigerian state. They are, in fact, the real Wahhabit movement. They claim their Saudi inspiration, and they are very popular. The Izala chased away Mohammed Yusuf in the mid 2000s because they considered him as being too radical, and because, according to them, he was not respecting the ideas of the movement. And it is at that time that Mohammed Yusuf founded his own movement, his own school of thought, that we will call later on uh, the Yusufiyah or Boko Haram. So to sum up, two arguments show that there is no real operational connection between Boko Haram and other jihadist groups. Um, these arguments are the fact that Boko Haram's doctrine doesn't match the doctrine of Daesh and that individual contacts never became real operational links. And there is also another factor. Maybe some of you have seen this beautiful film called Tombuktu. Uh, there's a scene in the movie which I found very interesting because it reminded me of Boko Haram. Uh, maybe you know that ACME was founded during the civil war in Algeria against Islamic movements after an election was cancelled by the military. It was in 1991 and this movement, which then became the GSPC, found shelter in the North Mali.
So in the beginning, the structure of this movement, which was then to become Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, was made of Algerian people. And in this scene of the movie, you can see an Algerian talking in Arabic with a Tuareg rebel. The, rebels, uh, the Tuareg rebels have been trying for a long time to, su to succeed in the North Mali. They try to communicate in Arabic, but at some point the Algerian, the Algerian says, it cannot be, his Arabic is absolutely terrible, I can't understand a word of it. And at that point they start talking in French. They start using the language of imperialism. Uh, they start talking in French because they simply can't understand each other in Arabic. So we often hear about a, a global jihad, uh, an international Islamic movement, but I think we tend to forget this particular problem, the problem of the language, because it's really hard to stage operations without speaking the same language, without understanding each other. It's quite stupid, really, but it's something that we must take into account when we analyze these movements. Here in the Borno, the, the language spoken is mostly Kanuri, but to be able to communicate with the other Nigerian people, Abu Bakar Shekau almost never uses Kanuri. He speaks Aousa, or sometimes Arabic. By the way, he doesn't speak Arabic so bad, uh, so we can very well imagine that there are discussions held in Arabic between Shekau and other people. However, for the other members of the group, it's much less likely. A fourth element which shows us that this link with Daesh is not as important as the med media tend to say is the fact that there is no diasporic dimension in Boko Haram. Indeed, from this perspective, Boko Haram is very different from the other movements. I was saying, saying it before, Acme comes from Algeria. Now look at the Shebab in Somalia. In Somalia, four-fifths of the population has been displaced since the end of the 1980s because of armed conflict. So there is, there is a huge Somali diaspora. And today, it's quite clear that when the Shebab attacked, attack the Westgate shopping mall in Nairobi, among them you can find Somalis from the, from the diaspora, from Norway, from Canada, for example. We also know that the Islamic State is recruiting, uh, for example, in the French suburbs, and uh, that some young French people choose to go fight there. It's not the case for Boko Haram, and this can be explained by very practical reasons. Try to go to Maidaguri. If you want to go to the Syrian battle zone, it's quite simple. You take a plane to Istanbul, and then you cross the Turkish frontier. But to enter the state of Borno is much more difficult. And this point is reinforced by the fact that many jihadist groups in the world don't agree with Boko Haram's and with the ideas of Abu Bakr Shekau, and they often think that the ideology of the movement tarnishes the very image of the jihad. The image given by Boko Haram, which is actually far from being the reality, is that they are merely a group of lunatics, and this is not particularly appealing for the bro for the so-called born abroad terrorists these jihadists which have been self-formed in the suburbs of the western towns. So this link with migration is not present, and this is very important. Now, Boko Haram, as I was saying, has evolved a lot. In the beginning, it was a sect which was inspired by the ideology of the Izala movement, but with some differences. As I was saying before, the Izala is a group inspired by the Wahhabi Saudi movement. It's a movement which emerged in the 1970s in Nigeria, but which doesn't reject the Nigerian state. The inspirer of this group, uh, Abu Bakar Goumi, who died in 1992, even said some words which can sound completely shocking for a true Salafist. At the time of the elections of 1979, there had already been a second republic with the end of the military dictator, and at the time of these elections, he said these words that I will quote, because they show how much the Izala movement uses this strategy of cooperating with the state without rejecting it. Rejecting it. He said, this year it's more important for a Muslim to vote during an election and to vote for a party close to the Islamic ideas rather than to make the pilgrimage to Mecca. These words, they are extremely important. Basically, the Izala movement, which was in the beginning the ideological mold of Muhammad Yusuf, doesn't claim a direct confrontation with the state. On his side, however, Muhammad Yusuf rejects the Western education because, according to him, it is perverting the soul of the Muslims. 
In fact, he doesn't reject modernity per se. He even uses modern technologies such as motorbikes, off-road vehicles, mobile phones, etc. What he rejects is, is this model which was inherited from the colonizers and which failed to develop the highly Muslim north of N Nigeria. So he launches his group. He's a very charismatic leader. And between 2002 and 2009, he's going to gain a real social influence. He manages to rally between 5,000 and 100,000 worshippers. So that's quite vague, I know. So if you want to choose in the middle, just, just go for it. So during this period, he was arrested many times because he was suspected of maintaining contact with Islamic and jihadist groups from Pakistan or Mauritania. But none of the trials succeeded, and nothing was ever proved. And we have to bear in mind that back at that time, between 2002 and 2009, until the extrajudicial execution of Mohammed Yusuf, it was a very well-established group. You could easily go to Maiduguri in the train station district to see him in his mosque on a Friday. So what are we really dealing with? Do you really think that in the past we could go and see Osama bin Laden in his mosque? No, of course not. By the way, there has been another group which was called uh, the Taliban of Nigeria who also tried to launch a cultural revolution and to run away from uh, the corruption of the cities and they tried to build an Islamic city which lasted only a few weeks in this area right here, an area which was deserted by the states at the frontier uh, between uh, Niger and Nigeria. This group, however, they rapidly conflicted with the police and then its refugees uh, joined the movement of Mohammed Yusuf. But at that time, the main recruitment method, if we want to make a short social study of the fighters of Boko Haram, the main recruitment method of the movement is through persuasion, through religious conviction. I talked with people who joined Boko Haram during this period, and it's, it was quite striking to me when you consider the current situation. I'm thinking in particular of a young man who was traveling around the region and who joined Boko Haram in 2005-2006. <coughs> And I asked him why he had joined Boko Haram, and he gave me this answer. I joined Boko Haram for the peace of mind. This was really surprising, because today you don't expect to hear, I'm going to fight with Boko Haram to achieve peace of mind. But at that time, it was a radical sect which rejected the state and which rejected the education inherited from a colonial model which had failed to develop the north and of the country. And here the political context also comes into play because since 1999, power was mainly concentrated in the hands of the Christians from the south. Before that, the military dictatorships were ruled by Muslims, but unfortunately I don't have time to go into details. So in a nutshell, there is a certain resentment which has built up and which participates today to the rising power of Boko Haram. Then comes the first great rupture and the first violent episode, the insurgency of 2009, which brought about a strong military repression and the killing of about a thousand people, which were essentially civilians. So today, when we talk about Boko Haram, we talk mainly about the horrors which were committed by the group. But I assure you that if you enjoy seeing videos of beheading, I can show you some which were clearly the responsibility of the army. And the same goes for raping girls, of course. The army knows very, very well how to do that and that's something that we must bear in mind so in 2009 we have the real the first real ep violent episode and the leader of the group Muhammad Yusuf is arrested by the army turned to the police and the police the police decides to do what it best does they murder him in prison I mentioned this because we have a, dat a database which is working on violent deaths in Nigeria, which show that when security forces intervene, whether it is the army or the police, in more than half the cases where there has been violent death and when the army intervenes in a conflict, instead of separating the fighters, they add another layer to violence by shooting and killing. By the way, the local riot control forces in Nigeria are nicknamed kill and go. Basically, they kill and then they leave. So they know really well how to kill, but managing a conflict to find a peaceful solution, that's another story. And this is a major issue at stake during the second period, which goes from 2009 up to the declaration of state of emergency in May 2013. During this period, a big change occurs because the group is drawn into the hostilities. Indeed, I insist once more on this. Until July 2009, Boko Haram wasn't a hostile group. It's very important to keep that in mind. In the beginning, it was merely a sect recruiting through persuasion.
In 2009, the group is drawn into hostilities, and some members of the movement run away, including in the city of Kano, which is the biggest city in the north of Nigeria. They start to make contact with other jihadist group, and that's pretty much when the hawks start to gain over the doves. Under the aegis of Ab Abu Bakr Shekau, the group is drawn into terrorism and they start committing suicide bombing, which is completely new in Nigeria. Bombing and car bombings are not new at all. I want to insist on that because today we all hear, oh, look at that, now there are terrorists in Africa committing bombing. But you should bear in mind that uh, during the Biafra Noir, which was a very big humanitarian case in the story of the country, uh, there were already some bombings which were committed. It was a war of secession which occurred between 1967 and 1970 in this region right there, and there were already bombing attacks committed on a helicopter or gas station in Lagos. In October 2010, when Nigeria celebrated its 50th birthday, a bombing attack was committed by the MEND, uh, which caused dozens of victims here. So when we talk about bombing attacks, it isn't something new, but uh, it's true that there is a big innovation with Boko Haram, which is suicide bombing. And between 2010 and 2013, until the state of emergency is declared, the best recruiting agent for Boko Haram is the army, because of its brutality. Indeed, one of the problems of the army, which is not the only one, of course, is that to maintain a community spirit, there is a kind of a rule which says that if you come from the south, you will be sent to the north and vice versa. So uh, the soldiers which are sent in Borno in 2009, they come from other regions of the country. They don't speak Kanori, they don't speak any local languages. And it's true that I always insist on this, that the question of languages, the languages are very important to understand the dynamics of a conflict. So if we tell you, hands up, and you don't understand what's going to happen, you will be shot. On top of this, uh, this Nigerian army is very used to killing civilians. Civilians are not spared. And as a result, there is a phenomenon of solidarity which takes place in the sense that some members of Boko Haram are going to hide with civilians, uh, civilians who choose not to turn them over because they don't trust the security forces. They fear that they will be arrested. I think we must stop this military propaganda which says that all this is linked to the lack of knowledge around Islam. The great speech of the army today is that Boko Haram keeps on recruiting because people don't really know the content of, it, of Islam. Well, between 2010 and 2013, in fact, Boko Haram recruited, and we have a lot of testimonies of this phenomenon, because some young people decided to avenge their parents who had been murdered by the army, or because they were seeking protection in the ranks of Boko Haram. And this is very important because it explains why today Boko Haram keeps on recruiting. I know the story of many young people who decided to seek protection in the ranks of Boko Haram because there is a kind of a generalized suspicion towards them. So for them, prevention is, is better than cure. They know very well that if they are arrested by the army, they will be tortured. So there is indeed this phenomenon of generalized suspicion which claims that all the young people are potentially culprits. And this is something that you can very well see in the images which have been broadcasted by Al Jazeera during the repression of 2009. You can see all these young people lined up on the ground, they all hood a, a wooden stick, the stick of the Canary Shepherds, and they are killed one by one with a submachine gun, without any further ado. These images, they circulate. It's true that the access to internet is very limited, but still, they circulate. And as a result, young people are afraid, and this explains in part why they join the ranks of the movement. Now, conversely to other much more org organized and professional smaller terrorist groups, Boko Haram has a social basis. It means that we're not only dealing with fighters. Above all, and, and in, especially in the beginning, it was a sect which seduced many young people, notably for the rejection of the dowry. Indeed, many Salafist groups condemned the principle of the dowry, which is a pre-Islamic African tradition, according to which men have to pay the bride's family in order to get married. By condemning this tradition, the Islamic Salafists, and notably Boko Haram, allow young men to have access to women at an earlier age. And this is also a factor which is strongly appealing. 
So among the ranks, the ranks of Boko Haram, uh, men are not the only one who fight. You can also find female combatants and child combatants. And this is also what distinguishes Boko Haram from Ansaru, which is a much more professional group. In 2013, however, things are going to change because there's going to be a rupture between Boko Haram and its social basis. The army finally realizes that it has lost lost the battle uh, that we call the battle over, over hearts and minds. And they realized that they were not well informed, that uh, they don't speak the language, that they don't know everything. So they decide to launch um, militias, paragovernmental militias called the Civilian Joint Task Force. These um, militias operate di directly in the villages and they have much more information because when you enter a village, it's not easy to identify the members of Boko Haram. It's not written all over them. They wear civilian clothes like in any other asymmetrical war. These militias, however, they know they have much more information and they represent a real threat for Boko Haram. And as a reaction, Boko Haram starts using a strategy of terror. They start, start slaughtering entire villages. They start targeting civilians in order to deter them from joining these militias. This corresponds to a new evolution in terms of violence, with on, this, on the one hand the strategy of terror which is launched by Boko Haram and also the massive repression from the Nigerian army. It's the first time since the Biafran war that the Nigerian Air Force bombs its own territory and mass killing occurs in the countryside. Okay, so here we have May 2013, that's the body count uh, due to violent death that we have in our database. In 2009, uh, there is a peak which is linked to the repression. Okay, you can see here very well the, the 2009 peak. And uh, then you can see here that there's a real explosion which starts in May 2013. And conversely to 2009, this is going to last much longer. Uh, this is when the army starts using heavy weapons and when they start going into the countryside. In 2009, the killings occurred mostly in the cities, um, in the cities of Baoshi and Maiduguri mostly, but this time they also kill in the countryside. And it also corresponds to the launching of the strategy of terror uh, of Boko Haram. And this body count, of course, continues today in a quite impressive way, even if it has gone down a little bit since the elections of March. So at this point, we enter a new era. We start to witness French recruitment, looting, mass atrocities committed by Boko Haram against civilians. But this phenomenon that I was explaining before is still true. Because of the brutality of the army, young people keep on joining the ranks of Boko Haram for fear of being accused of participating to the movement and arrested. And this is also true for Cameroon and Niger. Another phenomenon which isn't very much taken into account in the analysis is the problem of prisons. According to Amnesty International, there are 20,000 prisoners on behalf of the fight against terrorism in Nigeria. And since 2010, Boko Haram regularly attacks state prisons. In these prisons, they free their members, but they also free all of those who are waiting for their trial, what we call the AWT category, the awaiting trials. This category represents half of the inmates population of Nigeria, and it is a phenomenon which is widely uh, spread in Africa. Uh, those people um, have been in prison for two, five, ten years. They have never been brought, brought to trial, and they can very well die in prison without having ever been sentenced. And when these people are freed, they usually join the ranks of Boko Haram. Some impressive images were shot during the attack of a prison in Maiduguri in 2014. And indeed, you can see hundreds of people fleeing from the cells of a military compound, um, which, and these people are going to join uh, Boko Haram. So this also explains why Boko Haram keeps on recruiting today. So what is the situation today? I, I can see that time flies and we have to stop soon, so I'm going to move on. Today, we talk a lot about the internationalization of Boko Haram. Now, Boko Haram has indeed followers in the neighboring countries, in the region of Difa, in Niger, in the region of Chad and Cameroon, and this has been the case since the movement was founded in the beginning of the year 2000. What has really changed, however, is that before there was a kind of a modus vivendi, a kind of a mutual non-aggression agreement. 
Boko Haram had absolutely no interest in attacking the neighboring countries because their target was the Nigerian security forces and the Nigerian government. So there was a kind of a tacit agreement which consisted in saying, you don't attack me, I don't attack you. Niger, Chad, Cameroon, don't bother me and I won't bother you. Things started to get bad in Cameroon with the story of the Moulin Fournier. Maybe you remember about them. The Moulin Fournier were a French family with four kids and they were abducted in Cameroon by an armed gang from the north of the country and then sold to Boko Haram and Boko Haram negotiated their release. And what Chicao demanded, and unfortunately the videos are never perfectly translated, uh, but it was very clear, this demand was free our activists. And more precisely, free our men in Cameroon and free our women in Nigeria. Indeed, just before, during an attack in Damataru, Damaturu, the Nigerian army had almost caught Shekau and uh, had captured his wife and their newborn baby. So basically, Shekau was asking for their release. And in Cameroon, he was asking for the release of a dozen men, a dozen Boko Haram members, which had been arrested by the Cameroonian local police, which in fact didn't have a clue that these men were indeed members of Boko Haram. They had arrested them for armed trafficking, which is something quite familiar in the region. So the monophonia were therefore kidnapped, abducted, in order to negotiate the release of these people. So we still have this principle of non-aggression, which comes into play here. And it's a principle which has also been applied until the elections of 2011 in the neighboring states of Borno and Yube. Uh, there were also some non-aggression agreements with different state governors who didn't want to pay Boko Haram, but who were forced to do so by the same logic. If you give us some food, if you pay us, we won't attack you. We don't have any real mo motive to attack you, but if you don't pay us, we might. So it really was a modus vivendi, but when uh, the regional coalition between Cameroon, Chad and Niger was set up at the beginning of 2015, things changed. And at this moment, there is an extension, not so much of the influence area of Boko Haram, but rather of its military operational zone. We have seen uh, suicide bombings taking place in Jamena, some serious attacks in Difa recently, etc. So what are the possible scenarios for the future? First, an internationalization of the conflict. This is something that I mentioned in uh, the reports I have written for the Jean Jaurès uh, Foundation. I will leave a few copies to you and uh, you can download them on the internet. Uh, we must be very careful because an internationalization of the reaction could very well provoke an internationalization of the movement. As for now, there is no, no dias diasporic dimension of, in the movement. But after all, if states which claim to be friends with the West start to gather together in order to attack once again the Muslim martyrs, then it could very well lead to an internationalization of the insurgency. But according to me, this is not the most likely scenario. A much more likely scenario could be the following. Uh, the situation could follow the trajectory of the Lord Resistance Army in the north of Uganda. Uh, today we're dealing with a very toxic group, but very small, um, of about 300 combatants and not the supposedly 20,000 members which are attributed to Boko Haram during the summer 2014. And it is a group which will continue to disturb people's life for years, but which might gradually come close to extinction. And a third scenario would be that the group disappears just stops at once. It's possible. It happened, for example, during the great insurgency of Maitatsini in Kano in 1980. At that time, as usual, the army intervened with heavy weapon and they killed 5,000 people in 10 days. This is something which is really impressive. It has never happened with Boko Haram. In terms of intensity, killing 5,000 people in 10 days is huge. It reminds us a little bit of Hama in 1982 or of what was going on in the north of Iraq back at that time. So it was really a massive slaughter. In the case of Maitatsine, back at that time, things lasted five years with some small rebellions happening here and there in Maiduguri, for instance, and then all of a sudden it came to an end. So that's a possibility that we can't completely rule out. It might be possible to find a way to negotiate with Boko Haram, and uh, it, it is possible that the group ends up disappearing on its own. So, the election of Muhammadu Buhari has also played a major role. I'm sorry, I'm being quite long. Can I carry on? Okay, because I realize that I've only just finished my first part and I still have a lot to tell you. 
Anyway, the election of Buhari was a very important step, and we were very enthusiastic about this. Indeed, good luck, Jonathan, who was a president from the South, the South which is predominantly Christian, Christian, has very poorly managed the crisis of Boko Haram. In fact, he was giving the impression that he didn't really care. Honestly, as long as the killings occurred between Muslims in the state of Borno, where there is no oil, then in Abuja, in the capital, it seemed that it didn't really matter. Of course, it was a bit of a problem when a, suicide, when a suicide bombing was committed against the UNEP in 2011. Indeed, one attack was launched by Boko Haram against the United Nations. Um, and it is, by the way, very likely that the responsible of this attack was the faction which would later on become Ansaru. But apart from this, the killings occurring in Borno, a state which has no economic resources, doesn't really matter. It's much more serious, however, when an insurgency rises from the MEND in the Niger state, an oil producing state responsible for 95% of the state resources. In this case, it's a much greater problem, of course, and everybody seems to suffer from it in the entire Nigerian federation. So regarding the amnesty, which was more or less negotiated in 2012, well, I met with the negotiators and, in fact, they all agreed on something. The government never had the intention of negotiating the release of the prisoners with Boko Haram because they had no economic interest in doing so. So basically, during the last few years, the image given uh, is that of a very pernicious situation, rotting from inside, which was getting worse, with a very corrupted Nigerian army. By the way, this is true for all of the Nigerian institutions. It's not only true for the army. If you go check the health centers in Nigeria, you will easily realize this. But anyway, for the army, billions of dollars are invested in the fight against terrorism, but they never reach the field. There is a huge mistrust going on in the army, and since the soldiers are very poorly paid, the officers even refuse to give them weapons because they feel that they will resell them afterwards. That means that when there is an attack, soldiers are not sufficiently armed to defend themselves. Sometimes they are equipped with three bullets, for example, and that's all. They have three bullets, but once you have shot those three bullets, what are you going to do? You run away. So this is what was going on. This is why the elections of Muhammadu Buhari in March represent a major hope, and not only regarding the Boko Haram crisis. It's the first time since the independence of the country that there is a change of government which isn't the result of a coup or the use of force. So it's a strong democratic lesson. Of course, some will say that Muhammadu Buhari was an important leader during the military dictatorship of uh, 84 and 85. That's true. And if, on top of this, he's Muslim, and he has had unfortunate words regarding the Sharia law. Uh, since he's a military, he likes order, and what he particularly likes inside the Sharia law is discipline. So indeed, he has said that what he wanted was to set up the Sharia law on the entire territory. Of course, those are not his exact words, but that's pretty much it. Um, but still, he persisted and he was elected, and I believe that this is going to impose a new positive dynamic to Nigeria, beyond this democratic lesson that I was mentioning. Indeed, for the first time in the history of the country, a man of the street, whether it is a young man from the city or a farmer in the countryside, realizes that by casting a vote in a ballot paper, he can make things change in Abuja. This is a huge lesson. It's a very positive lesson. Moreover, Buhari is not a military dictator anymore. He doesn't come to power with the intention, the intention to rule alone. He's ruling a regional coalition, and he has been elected both by Muslims from the north and by Christians. Christians from the southwest, as well as Christians from the plateau state, voted for him. Maybe we can go down a little bit on the map? No, okay, that's fine. Okay, so here, right here, you can see uh, the uh, plateau state. Maybe you've heard of it because there are often violences taking place between Muslims and Christians. Well, in this plateau state, some Christians voted for Buhari because they believed that he would be more efficient in dealing with, in dealing with the Boko Haram threat than a Christian president like Good Luck. Jonathan. So there has been a real enthusiasm around his election, and this is what could make things change. It's not so much because Buhari is a Muslim or because he's a military, it's because he represents hope. 
Being a researcher, sometimes people ask me, what should, what should we do? I don't know what we should do to eliminate Boko Haram. I do know, however, what shouldn't be done. And when you're dealing with an asymmetrical war, the state has absolutely no chance of winning if he doesn't have the support of the civilians. This is what the specialists on counterinsurgencies mean when they say that you have to win the hearts and minds. So basically, the armies from Nigeria, Niger, Chad or Cameroon don't stand a chance of winning if they don't gain the support of civilian populations. And today, Buhari represents hope. The population of Borno used to refuse to cooperate with the authorities for the different reasons I have explained before, and also because they had the feeling that they were being rejected, abandoned by good life, Jonathan. Indeed, already in 2011, they had voted massively for Buhari, so they had the feeling that were, they were being punished for this. The governor of Borno, Shetima, was also in an open conflict with Abuja. So just imagine the situation in terms of coordination. We are in a federation, uh, and when Abuja said white, Shetima said black, and on top of this, the authorities were not coordinating. It means that inside the army, the air force would bomb the soldiers, the soldiers would, sh would shoot the policemen, the police would shoot the militia, and on top of this, when Shetima in the Borno state said that we had to move east, well, Abuja replied that we had to move west, so it was completely chaotic. Now, today, we have a certain consistency. Buhari and Chetima get along well, they're going to work together, and Buhari, as I've said, represents hope, which means that today, the civilian population without whom we can't win against Boko Haram turn to the state in a much more positive behavior. The state is being legitimized again, and hope is absolutely fundamental. This is what can make things change. One thing which is probably not going to change, however, is corruption. Corruption doesn't disappear overnight. The Nigerian army has always been corrupted, so this will take time. Reprofessionalizing the army will also take time, even if today, in the midst of this generalized enthusiasm which has followed the election of Buhari, um, we must remember that John Kerry, Laurent Fabius, the German foreign minister, they all went to Abuja. Well, maybe we can foresee an international cooperation, uh, which will probably take place in favor of the Nigerian state. And at the time of good luck, Jonathan, this wasn't the case at all. So basically, this is all very positive. But concerning the reprofessionalization of the army, I have my doubts. Even if there will probably be instructions coming from Buhari so that the army stops targeting civilians and be more respectful of human rights. And the behavior of the army is not a, even a moral consideration, it's simply counterproductive. You can't win against Boko Haram if you don't have the support of the civilians. So, on this point, it's going to be positive. My concern, however, is focused on the impact that the international coalition could have in the region. I'm going to give you a precise example, and then I'll stop so that we can have a discussion. Let's look at what happens today in Niger. What are the sources of funding for Boko Haram? Well, first, let's stop rambling about the money sent by the Arabic Emir, because this simply isn't true. Uh, my point is that it's a very cheap insurgency, a low-cost insurgency, which lives from looting, ransoming, and racketeering. Their main war weapon is a Chinese motorbike, which costs about 600 euros. You place three men on it, and you attack. One is driving, the other is shooting, and the last one takes care of the ammunition. This is the real war weapon in the countryside of Borno. So when the movement needs funding, it taxes the trade of fish, which generates a certain amount of money, if, in, if of course, it's far from being like oil. And uh, they also tax uh, the growing of peppers along the river, which is situated right here. The response given by the Nigerian authorities to this was, I believe, quite wrong, because the first mistake they made was to try to starve Boko Haram of its funding sources by forbidding fish, fish trade and pepper crops. The problem is, by doing this, the result, I mean, the result is going to be complicated. What are the local populations going to eat? I have met some people, uh, a mechanic, for example, who has moved to Borno in order to work for Boko Haram because he didn't have a job anymore. Indeed, on top of this, uh, the government 
also uh, banned the traffic of motorbikes in the region. And the problem is that motorbikes in these rural regions are absolutely fundamental because there are no public transports, no bus, etc. So when the traffic of motorbikes was banned, uh, this uh, mechanic uh, of whom I was speaking lost his job. So what did he do? He moved to Borno to repair the motorbikes of the members of Boko Haram. Another operation was organized two months ago. An attack killed about 40 soldiers belonging to the army of Niger in the islands of the Lake Chad. And the response of the authorities from Niger was to evacuate the 25,000 civilians living in these islands. The question was then, where do we put them? They decided to play them, place them in a refugee camp which was to be set up by the HCR. The problem is that the HCR was never able to set up the camp. As you know, there is a rule when we deal with refugee camps. There must be a distance of 50 kilometers between, uh, between the camp and the frontier in order to avoid insurgent groups, and in that case, uh, Boko Haram, to start recruiting in these camps. So you need 50 kilometers. The problem is that 50 kilometers away, we get closer to all producing regions which are controlled by the Chinese, and above all, there is nothing there, no water, no water deposit. And this is what the situation is completely flawed. The HCR, HCR spends each year in Niger between 5 to 10 percent of its budget in order to finance military escorts for the army of uh, Niger. So it's not free. So basically, you're telling the HCR that they have to set up very quickly a refugee camp for these 25,000 25, civilians and that they will need military escorts. The HCR says, OK, we'll organize military escorts. But then the state says, yeah, well, you know what? Right now, we're a bit busy, so we can't really provide you with these escorts. So you have 25,000 people who wander around in this region, who can't fish, who can't grow pepper. Um, so what do you do with them? Once more, we raise the same issue. You can't win a war without the support of the civilians. So in a nutshell, what is a concern to me today are uh, these different points. The brutalities committed by the armies from Chad and Cameroon with this generalized suspicion towards the youth, which encourages some young people to join the ranks of Boko Haram, and also these economic sanctions, which have a strong impact on civilians. And I don't even say that out of a humanitarian preoccupation. It's completely counterproductive. How are these populations going to survive and what will be their livelihoods? OK, I'm going to stop there. And if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer. Okay, the first question is for me. The Nigerian army is one of the most powerful army in the African region. They have many soldiers. They have once launched a peacekeeping operation in Liberia and Sierra Leone. Um, however, it is completely inefficient when fighting against Boko Haram. So why is that? Okay, yeah, one of the reasons that I was saying is corruption. As I was saying, there were there are billions of dollars who are invested in the security forces, but they never reach the field. Six billion dollars a year are spent, but this amount of money doesn't go to Borno. So we have a major corruption problem, which also concerns soldiers because they are very poorly paid. And uh, since they're poorly paid, the officers don't want to give them arms because they fear that they will resell these arms to Boko Haram. This is something I have already explained. We also lack, as I was saying, political support. Um, there wasn't any political support from good luck Jonathan towards the army, as I was also saying before. Now, you mentioned the peacekeeping operation of the Nigerian army in Liberia and in Sierra Leone. And it is often an argument which is used to justify the fact that it was once a great army. Back at that time, I was participating to a research group on this matter, and we even wrote a book with Jean-Christophe Ruffin. And I went to Liberia during the civil war, and honestly, there is much to tell about this peacekeeping operation, which was called Ecomog. 
ECOMOG um, stands for ECOWAS Monitoring Group. It was uh, the ceasefire monitoring group in Liberia. And it acted under the aegis of ECOWAS, the Economic Community of West African States. And the Liberian, which have, who have a great sense of humor, had nicknamed this operation Every Car or Moving Object Gone, because every moving object was taken. And I investigated this at that time, and I realized that, in fact, um, the ships, the Liberian ships, the ships from Liberia, were used by the Nigerian army to organize drug trafficking. Uh, by the way, that's one of the great successes of the Nigerian economy. Nigeria has never produced any drugs, but we estimate that up to 30% of the heroin, which is sold in some big cities like Washington, has passed through the hands of a Nigerian drug dealer. <coughs> so Nigeria controls a great deal of the international trafficking, and the army has played a major role in this drug trafficking. So basically, I think that uh, the corruption problems which lie at the heart of the Nigerian army, they're not something new, it's something which dates back from quite a long time. Uh, so we have corruption, we have lack of political will back at that time with good luck Jonathan, even if this might change now. Uh, we had also complete impunity for the army officers and lack of coordination. And this is quite terrible really because everybody distrusts everybody in part because of this corruption. corruption. They all wonder with if the others are not working with Boko Haram. There is a strong suspicion inside the security forces. The SSS, the state security services, refuse to communicate information to the land army. The land army mistrusts the air force. The air force mistrusts the police. The police mistrust the militias, etc. So um, all of this explains why the, the army is inefficient in this battle. And the lack of political support, as I was saying, is really fundamental. But maybe uh, on this particular point, uh, things could evolve now. Hello? According to you, can we consider that the recent terrorist attack in Jamena were committed by Boko Haram? Well, yes, of course. According to me, there isn't a shred of a doubt. And since January, I've been telling myself that some attacks were going to be organized. For those of us who follow closely the situation, it wasn't a surprise at all. It was all planned. You know, it's a sect which works a lot on the basis of retaliation. There isn't necessarily a very well organized plan to attack the capital of the Nigerian state, but from the moment you attack, you know that they will counterattack. It can take time, of course. Some of the leaders of Izala have condemned Boko Haram and they were killed only five years later. But they have their blacklist. So in that case, there were some videos of Shekau saying, you, Isufu, I'm going to get you, you, Paul Biya, I'm going to attack you, etc. So from the moment the Chadian army decided to enter Borno and to attack Boko Haram, it was quite clear that there was going to be a response. We're dealing with an asymmetrical war here, uh, which means that they don't have uh, the means to fight against tanks, they can't resist frontal fightings. Um, so their response will rather be suicide bombings, surprise attacks against military compounds. And this is exactly what is going on in Jamena and in Difa today. To give you an example, when in January 2015 the international coalition was created, and when the parliament in Niamey, which is 1,400 kilometers away from Difa, voted to authorize the army of Niger to enter the Nigerian state of Borno, suicide bombings were committed in retaliation on the markets of Difa and in the region of Bozo, which is very close to the lake. And this, these attacks, and this is what I was saying in my introduction, they reveal very well the disintegration of the conflict into social micro-conflicts, which are very complex to solve. In the dislocated society of Borno, in, the, in, the same, in one same family, you can have a brother fighting for the militia, another fighting for Boko Haram, and the third one who will be a policeman. That's the reality, and sometimes they even switch groups. 
The suicide bombings in that case, they were committed by uh, Buduma people. The Buduma, they are not Kanuri. Um, the Kanuri are pretty much the hardcore basis of Boko Haram. Uh, the Buduma, they are people who have fled the Islamization and the attacks led by the Kanuri of the Empire of Borno. Because the Empire of Borno was a great empire who was Islam Islamicized in the 11th century. And um, it was occupying this whole region, a region which was much wider than the actual frontiers. Majority of the fighters at that time were, were Kanuri and also a few Aousa. So when I went to this particular region, I was very surprised to see that some Buduma, who were people who had actually found shelter in the islands of the Lake Chad, precisely to escape the Islamization uh, and the Muslims. So there were people who converted recently who were not necessarily considered as good Muslims. And they were, in fact, those who were committing terrorist attacks. And these attacks were meant in part to chase away the Aousa migrants coming from the northwest of Nigeria. Uh, the Aousa arrived in the 1970s and they started to trade the fish which was caused by the Buduma. So for the Buduma, entering the conflict next to Boko Haram is a way to get rid of the Aousa and to take back the control of the fish trade, even if today, as I was saying, uh, trading fish is forbidden. So uh, this retaliation game, it's quite clear. And uh, if and when the neighboring countries enter the fight, then Boko Haram will attack them. This is simply unavoidable. And we can also very well see the, the, this phenomenon of disintegration of the conflict, which takes us very far away from the initial lo logic, which was to establish an Islamic state. I didn't have time also to tell you what the claims of Boko Haram are, but I can tell you that um, these claims are previous to Daesh, uh, but unfortunately we're running out of time, so I can't uh, tell much about this. I wanted to know if the movement enrolls children or teenagers, and uh, more generally I have seen uh, some videos uh, which were made by some leaders of Boko Haram, and in these videos they just seem nuts. So my question is, are they psychi psych psychiatric or simply junkies? Okay, concerning children, as I was saying, it's a sect with children. For about a year and a half now, uh, we're starting to see children and women who commit suicide bombing. And there are many reasons to this. First, it's easier for a woman to pass through uh, the roadblocks of the police or the army than a man. In the Muslim culture, for a man uh, to touch and search a woman, it's something which is uh, quite complicated. And uh, we can also interpret this phenomenon as the sign that the group has troubles recruiting men and therefore needs to recruit women. Anyway, whatever the reasons, it's quite undeniable that for about a year and a half now, women and children have started committing suicide bombing. I have heard some testimonies from Difa last year, uh, which told me that some women had participated in the fightings during an attack on a village. We need to distinguish these two things, the attack on a village, which is uh, a group attack, and the suicide bombing, which is only one individual. It's not the group attacking, it's one person with a belt of explosives. For suicide bombings, uh, women are quite numerous, and even in the group attacks, we're starting to see women. Are these people uh, enrolled on a voluntary basis, or are they women who grow inside the community of Boko Haram? I don't have this information. Um, I don't have. I don't know. For obvious obvious reasons, it's impossible to interview them after the the bombing, and before it's extremely complicated. Many researchers. Uh, I have a colleague, for instance, who has worked a lot on suicide bombings committed by women in Chechnya and Palestine, and it remains a sort of mystery from a psychological perspective. But at the same time, the idea of sacrifice in war is not something which is confined to uh, the jihadist. You probably know about the suicide commando operations where there are very few chances of surviving. It's not exactly the same because you can still have a slight chance of surviving, whereas with suicide bombings you know you're going to be killed. But anyway, there is this sense of sacrifice which can play a role. Uh, but it's true that I don't have details on the indoctrination methods which are used in order to convince young girls to commit such attacks. And do they use drugs? 
Okay, now regarding drugs, I can say that there are a lot of fantasies which circulate. I have read some reports written by the European Union which apply the same logic inherent to ACME. Indeed, ACME uh, financed itself in the northern Mali thanks to drug trafficking because these, this deserted area worked as a staging post for the drug traffic in South America. So many people just assumed that the same logic could be applied for Boko Haram. But honestly, given the complexity of the situation on the field and the difficulty to enter Borno, you would have to be completely stupid uh, if you wanted to uh, smuggle drug into Libya through Borno. It would be completely nuts. So really, I wonder what happens in the head of these European experts to write such things. As far as I know, no element shows today that drug trafficking is used as a funding source for Boko Haram. Now, there is one drug which circulates, and it's a kind of a painkiller. I can't remember the name now. What is it called? Um, Tramadol, right? I think. Yeah. So the Nigerian army has already claimed many times that they had killed Abu Bakr Sheko. Apparently, he's a cat with seven lives. But because each time he reappears in the video saying, hi, it's me, I'm back. But anyway, apparently there was one time in 2013 when they almost got him and they injured him. So it's possible that he's using tramadol in excess. Now many things are being said on this matter. Sometimes we hear that the that Shekau, uh, that the Shekau we have seen recently is not the same as before. He's an actor or a double. Honestly, I can't say I don't have the information on this question. So drug trafficking to finance Boko Haram, no way. Tramadol circulate, circulating for the fighters, uh, yes, probably, and it's also a phenomenon which exists in Somalia with the amphetamines. But a large scale drug trafficking uh, involving heroin, cocaine, etc. No, really, I don't think so. The drugs are creating are merely painkillers.